The following program is a PodcastOne.com production. From Hollywood, California, by way of the Broken Skull Ranch, this is the Steve Austin Show. Give me a hell yeah. Hell yeah. Now, here's Steve Austin. All right, everybody, here we go. Let's start this podcast off. Once again, I'm sitting in a hotel room. It's a Grand High Regency, and if you can hear airplanes take off and land in the background, it's because I'm literally right, you know, a couple hundred yards from the runway. And the amazing thing about this airport is, man, you talk about some badass windows, man. These these windows are got to be triple pane or whatever because I can hear a little bit of rumbling. But for the most part, for the view that I have and as close as these airplanes are, this is absolutely spectacular. I always dig watching these big-ass planes take off and land. American Airlines taking off right now. If you hear that rumble in the background, air traffic control is about a quarter mile away. I know those cats in there busy guiding them airplanes to and from and lining them all up, put them in a rotation to bring them in and get them out. That's got to be a hectic job. <laughs> it takes me back to that airplane movie so many years ago uh, with uh, Leslie Nielsen and, uh, God dang, all the, all the great cats that were in that movie. Uh, one of my favorite movies of all time. So picked a bad day to quit amphetamines. Picked a bad day to quit sniffing glue, all kinds of stuff. Uh, but anyway, just watching these airplanes take off reminds me of that movie. And the uh, subject at hand, I was going to talk about, uh, you know, Dallas, Texas, the Sportatorium, world-class championship wrestling way back in the day. And to start the story off, I guess I ended up in the Dallas-Fort Worth area in 1986. I just finished playing junior college ball. And uh, 84, 85, or 83, 84, whatever it was, I graduated high school in 1983. And I tell you what, man, when I came out of Edna High School, I was Mr. Cowboy. We were the Edna Cowboys in my senior year because I was Mr. Badass. I was Mr. Cowboy. I was a running back. I played fullback and tailback. I ran north and south because I was not fast enough to run east or west. I ran over people. I weighed about 205 pounds. My line weighed about 160 pounds. I made a lot of yards after contact. Now, with that being said, in today's system, or if I'd have been in a Houston school, I'd probably have been sitting on a bench. But this was in Edna, Texas, and I was a pretty damn good running back back in the day. On defense, I played linebacker. I liked hitting people. I didn't uh, have great discipline. Uh, I always went to the football But I tell you what, based on my athletic ability, you know, I thought I was going to go to a Division I school, you know, and I went and took a visit up to Rice University. And Rice University, uh, now they have a great baseball program, but they've never really been known for football, except back in the days in 56, 57, 58, the, the years my father, Ken Williams, played running back. For the Rice Owls, and uh, when they when my dad was playing with Rice, they went to the Cotton Bowl and lost to Navy 21 to seven. And my dad scored Rice's touchdown in that game. So I remember coming out of high school, I thought I was going to be you know Division One running back, and boy, I tell you what, reality set in, and I found out that you know being a, a pretty badass player on a small South Texas team was pretty cool, but when you started looking to the grand scheme of things, not so fast, my friend, as Lee Corso would say. So I had two options. I had a chance to go to Wharton County Junior College, which is about 60 miles south of Houston, Texas, or I could go to uh, Texas Lutheran College on a half scholarship. Well, a half scholarship ain't worth a damn, and I needed the money. My parents have always been middle class, but, you know, we worked for everything we had. You had to buy your own car. You had to do your own stuff. You had to buy your own education. My parents didn't have the money to send nobody to college. So Warden County Junior College was my destination, about 60 miles down the road from Edna. And so, man, it was the Wharton Junior County Pioneers. The Pioneers is not the fiercest name in the world, but that's what we were. And our colors were white and red or red and white. And they brought me in, and I tell you what, man, they were loaded with talent. Here's the thing about junior college football, I found out. Because when I went to junior college, right before I left, I told my mother's friend, Evelyn, I said, you know what, Evelyn, don't worry about it. I said, "Uh, you know what, I'll just go down to this junior college, and I'll make All-American a couple of years, and then I'll get a scholarship to a big school and do that, and then end up in the pros. (laughs) <laughs> well, once again, as Lee Corso would say, not so fast, my friend. 
in junior college, you got some of the damnedest athletes in the United States of America. You know, you got some guys with some learning problems, uh, some dyslexics, um, just people that uh, just got off track. Maybe they got in trouble. They need a cooling off period. But, man, there are some football-playing SOBs in the junior college football ranks, which I was soon to find out. So I roll in there, Billy Badass, thought I was something, just like everybody did, does when they come out of a high school program and go into uh, college. You know, I had a lot of confidence, and I was ready to run over some ass and carry the football. Well, they had a bunch of good running backs that they had recruited out of the Pasadena and the Houston area come in there. And these guys are a little bit faster than me. I didn't think they was quite as tough a runners as me, but nonetheless, I didn't have enough speed at the junior college level. And I believe I was clipping in at about a four nine second, and that was a mid four nine. It wasn't a four eight nine. It was a four nine. But from here to five feet away, if you put a sandwich on the table, I was the fastest guy on the team. So anyway, the logical thing, the best thing to do with me, uh, since I was a good athlete, was move me to linebacker. So there, I played linebacker at Wharton Junior College for two years and started. And I remember. Uh, we got our ass kicked two years in a row. I believe we finished three and eight and two and nine in the two seasons that I played at Wharton County Junior College. We might have had one more win than that, but it wasn't uh, it wasn't the greatest program in the world. I met a lot of great guys and made a lot of friends on that team, and I used to keep up with a few of them way back in the day. But, yeah, man, just is the same thing with the wrestling thing. You know, there's not too many guys I ended up keeping up with, and, and about once a year, once every two or three years, I'll reach out to somebody and talk about the old days. But then, uh, then came the next step. And based on uh, what I'd accomplished at Wharton County Junior College, based really more on athletic ability and hustle, and hustle was the biggest part of my game, whether it was playing catcher uh, when I played baseball. I was about a five-time all-star playing baseball. Uh, it, it was always about hustling and uh, never giving up and, and always uh, scrapping. And if I, if I missed a ball or something got by me, man, I was back here in a heartbeat throwing that ball down a second. And I had a pretty good arm on me. Uh, as a catcher, uh, you weren't going to steal too many bases on Steve when he was catching. And so anyway, again, back to football, based on my athletic ability, I had two offers coming out of Wharton County Junior College for my junior and senior years for college football. And again, you know, I, I, I had a you know, designs on being an insurance man, just like my father was. And I figured, okay, I'll go get a business degree and I'll get in the insurance business once I get my degree. You know, I'd thought about being a pro wrestler, but at this point in time, you know, I was just doing the thing, education, general studies, but then I was going to segue into business and be an insurance man with my dad. So I had two offers, uh, and that's all I had. Well, actually, I had three offers. I had an offer to the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, uh, New Mexico. I had an offer to North Texas State University, which is in Denton, Texas, 30 miles away from Dallas, Texas. And then I also had a full ride this time from Texas Lutheran College in Seguin. Well, uh, Texas Lutheran College, with all due respect, didn't have the greatest football program in the world. He's going to take a lot of thumpings over there. And, uh, you know, I didn't think I really wanted to do the TLC thing. So then I took the visit to Albuquerque, New Mexico, and it was phenomenal up there. It was beautiful. They took me skiing. I've been skiing, snow skiing, three times in my life. And I remember going up to the top of Sandia Peak and skiing down and using that famous snow plow and uh, running over a couple of people in the process because I couldn't put the brakes on fast enough. But that's a whole other story for a whole other day. And they showed me around campus, uh, met the coach, had a great visit, and everything was cool in the gang. And uh, I said, all right, man, they offered me the full ride. And that's when I went to Denton, Texas, to make my other visit to that location. And I went out to uh, Denton and had a bunch of nice guys show me around. And, you know, I really hadn't drank too much in my junior college days, kind of kicked it up on my sophomore year and was drinking a lot of wild turkey 101 and some beer. And we went out in North Texas and I kind of bonded with some of those guys. And it felt like uh, that was going to be the next step for me, that I needed to stay in Texas. I really like the uh, University of New Mexico Lobos. I like the gimmick. I like the mascot. The school was cool. Sandia Mountains were just outside of Albuquerque. It was uh, a beautiful location. But, man, when it all came down to making that decision, 
I just couldn't leave the great state of Texas, my home. And so I said, all right. I went in there and saw Corky Nelson, the head coach. He said, we want you to play football here. And I said, all right. I said, I'll sign up. So I remember signing that letter. I came into Denton, Texas, and I moved into the athletic dormitory, and I played football for two years. And again, uh, <laughs> they brought me in as a linebacker, and they had a great linebacker corps. Uh, I played a second-string linebacker behind a guy named Lance White, who was an outstanding linebacker, and there's just no getting around it. He was better than me, so I backed him up. And I'll never forget, we were out on the uh, – practice field and it was time to run 40 yard dashes now back in the day my name was still now back in the day my name was still steve williams i had not changed it to steve austin i was still a civilian playing college football and when my stepfather adopted us and changed our name that's who i was you know my previous name was steve anderson after my biological father so we're out there running 40 yard dashes one time and uh I'll tell you what, man, the coach kind of had this perplexed look on his face as I ran back and forth. And finally, he looks at me and he says, Williams, come here. And so I go over and I say, yeah, coach, what do you want? He goes, you're running a 4-9. I said, yeah, coach, uh, I always run a 4-9. And he, he looks at me and he goes, your junior college coach told me you ran a 4-7. My junior college coach was padding my stats to try to help me get another offer to another school. 4-9 probably wasn't going to cut it. He was right. He goes, 4-9? I said, yes, sir. I said, I never run a 4-7 in my life. He says, get out of here. Boy, he was pissed off, so I ran back and joined the guys. So anyway, I played uh, backup linebacker my junior season there at North Texas State with a good good bit amount of uh, time on the field. And, of course, on kickoff returns, kickoff coverage, I was on all the special teams doing what I needed to do, getting a free education. Now, along the way, I ran into a math class called algebra, and I ran into an accounting class. And I tell you what, although I was a National Honor Society student at Edna High School, I think because I had about a B-plus average, and really the teachers kind of liked me, uh, but I put me in, they put me in the National Honor Society. So I was smart, but I wasn't exactly a rocket scientist. And when you threw college-level uh, math at me, Man, I can add, subtract, multiply, and divide like it ain't nobody's business. But when you throw in word problems and decimals and percentages and all that other stuff, man, forget about it. So I dropped algebra. And then I went over to the accounting class. And I tell you what, man, all the little debits and credits, I was thinking to myself, oh, man, this is easy. This is cool. Being an accountant is easy. Well, that's when they threw the more advanced stuff at me. And I promptly dropped accounting as well as algebra and picked up some more classes. Now, I don't want this to sound like I'm a quitter when faced with adversity. I just knew that I didn't like math, I didn't like accounting, and being a business major wasn't in the cards for me. So I switched up majors to be a physical education major, and I figured, you know what? Uh, If I just get a degree, maybe I can go into insurance, or if I just get a degree, I'll turn into a coach. I'll coach high school football. I'll teach a subject or whatever, but that's going to be my game plan. So anyway, back to the football field. I remember we was playing at North Texas Stadium, Aaron. I think these days they've renamed the school University of North Texas. But back in the day, it was the North Texas State University. We was the Mean Green Eagles and the legendary, the one and only, uh, Hall of Famer, Mean Joe Green of the Pittsburgh Steelers, Steel Curtain Defense played at North Texas State way back in the day, and that was kind of, you know, their claim to fame was that he played football there. Well, we wasn't so mean when we played. And I remember it was on a kickoff return or kickoff coverage, and I ran down the field hauling ass with my 4.9 speed, and I jacked up the dude that I was supposed to, you know, block. And when I did, I planted my left leg wrong, and I went down on the artificial turf. And that was the first time I'd ever played on our official turf was when I got to North Texas State University. And it was a real interesting process because it makes you a little bit faster than you are, but your legs stick a little bit more uh, than they do on a grass field. And I went down, and uh, what I'd done is tore my ACL. And this was the beginning of a long-lasting uh, career with uh, knee problems. And that's how I first tore that first ACL. And here's the thing. When I went and got the uh, x-rays, MRIs on that knee, I had what's called 
a mop end tear in the middle of the ACL, meaning right in the middle of the ACL, rather than turning it off the or origin or insertion point, I tore the middle of the ligament and so it, it, and just kind of frayed it out, but it was still connected. It wasn't doing a whole lot of good, but it wasn't all, all the way torn. The meniscus, the, uh, the uh, other aspects of my knee were just fine, so they decided with that ligament being mostly intact but partially torn, with the PCL being in good shape, just rehab it and not do surgery. And they scoped it to go in there with a the scope and find all this stuff out. The integrity of my knee was fine, so we just said, hey, we'll rehab and come back and play the senior season. My senior season, I came back, and they decided to position me at weak side defensive end. And weak side defensive end was a little bit easier position for me just because I didn't have to uh, read so much traffic in the backfield. By the time those uh, centers, the guards started pulling tackles, and by the time the quarterback started doing his business, doing the handoffs with the running backs, it was really too much stuff for a guy like me uh, to digest. So by moving me out to defensive end, it was a much easier read. I was normally working off the tackle of the tight end. And so basically jacking them up, you know, looking inside, and I had outside contain. Never, ever get hooked. <laughs> if you get hooked, you're dead because that, that means if, if I'm out there to contain, I'm supposed to, to, to funnel everything back to the inside of the field. Uh, my responsibility was not letting anybody get out past me. So... Every now and then, I'd get hooked, and, man, it was not good. Uh, so it's an embarrassing play when you get hooked by the tight end or tackle and knocked out of the play. So anyway, I was good enough to start, and we had a really, really badass defensive end, Tom Middaw, over on the strong side. And I think Tom was probably uh, up for All-American or at least off-conference, but he was highly touted out of uh, – I think he played – uh Hurst or uh, Hurst Euless Bedford area here in the uh, DFW area. He was somewhat of a, you know, real local star who was known on the statewide level. He played strong side, and Tom was a football playing son of a gun, and I was over at the weak side. But anyway, to get back to wrestling, my scholarship ran out, and our defensive uh, line coach, I can't remember his name, but I just remember he had a connection with Watkins Motor Lines. And, you know, when you're in college, you know, I had an athletic scholarship. I don't think we could work during the year, whatever the ramifications were. But he would get a lot of the guys on as casuals, kind of part-time workers at Watkins Motor Lines. And so, man, between uh, classes after season, you know, I would go down to the freight dock. I'd drive into Dallas, Texas to Watkins Motor Lines, and I would load trucks and unload trucks, manual labor, and I would drive a forklift. And uh, i tell you what, me and my buddy Rob, who played uh, junior college with me, and he came up to North Texas State with me, and we were the best of friends. And uh, his dad was a physics professor at Texas A&M University. And uh, Rob came up to North Texas State, and, man, we'd carpool back and forth together to Dallas. And we were on, worked on the same shift. We were both casuals. And then we both went full-time. And we both worked our way up to full-time pretty much faster than anybody else that had really ever been at Watkins. And so I think back in the day, and it's a shoot, I think this is uh, probably 87, I was making 12 bucks an hour working at Watkins Motor Lines that put me on full time. And, uh, you know, I remember, you know, during my college days, we would drive up to the Dallas Sportatorium. And I had this, when I lived in, in uh, Kerr Hall, the athletic dormitory at North Texas State, I had a little bitty ass color television. I mean, this is about a 14 or 16 inch, man, if that. It might have been a 12 inch screen because this is way back in the day. And that thing was big and heavy, but the screen wasn't very big. And I tell you what, man, world class championship wrestling was on fire. And, man, I probably got about maybe seven or eight, nine channels. But channel 11, KTVT, was one of the channels I got. And I tell you what, man, I'd be up late at night. I had my, you know, guy set up there. We'd. I always use cinder blocks and some one by twelves to make a shelving system, and for a good part of the time, uh, my, one of my roommates had left out, so I was rooming by myself, which is an absolute luxury, and I shared my bathroom with my suite mates. So it was four guys to one bathroom. That wasn't the funnest thing in the world, but there for a while, I was had a whole room by myself, with it, which was a luxury. And so I was watching pro wrestling, and then uh, you know. 
I got burned out on uh, college research papers, and I decided, you know what, man, this ain't for me. I think I'm going to drop out and just work over at the freight dock full time. So that's what I did. Unceremoniously, I dropped out of college, and uh, I had paid, you know, the athletic scholarship that I had gotten had paid for four solid years of school. And I was doing pretty good workloads, you know, 18 hours, uh, 15 hours. I think at last semester I had 13 hours. That was a little bit of a light load. I needed 17 credits, 17 hours to get my degree in physical education and dropped out. And I tell you what, when I called my parents, they were none too happy about the fact that, you know, their first kid that was going to graduate college and had an athletic scholarship and had put in four and a half years was about to drop out. And I did. And I actually wasn't really enamored with playing football at, at North Texas State University. And I actually briefly entertained the thoughts of quitting the football team because, eh, man, it was just hotter than hell out there. I didn't see the future of pro football at the time because uh, I, I saw the writing on the wall. Uh, but I wouldn't quit because I signed up on that athletic scholarship. They gave me an opportunity for a spot on that team. And I was not going to quit because that would have meant that they could have given that scholarship to some other athlete who may have been more deserving or wanted it more than I do. And when I gave them my word that I was going to play for them for two years, I was going to fulfill my commitment to the North Texas State University Mean Green football team. And I did. That was the only reason I quit was because I knew I needed to uh, fill out my obligation because I, I gave them my word. So football was over. I had paid for that semester by myself. And during uh, the course of uh, my time in uh, North Texas State University, on occasion, we would drive up to the Dallas Sportatorium. And uh, almost everybody who listens to this podcast knows that the Sportatorium was an old rat hole building on the, on the corner of uh, Industrial and Cadiz. And this was an old white building. It had Sportatorium written in blue letters. And way back in the day, Elvis Presley played there, George Jones Johnny Cash, I mean, it seated probably, I'm guessing, 5,000 people, and it was just, uh, it smelled like beer, piss, hot dogs, popcorn, uh, you name it, uh, sweat, stench, uh, concrete floors, and when it went down to the wooden floors, it was just one of the greatest buildings in the history of pro wrestling that I've ever been in, one of my favorites, especially when you had the people packed in there, and I'm telling you, I used to pay my money, and I can't remember how much it cost us to go down there and get in. It might have cost us 10 bucks, and we didn't have a lot of money, but we all had 10 bucks, and we would load up in my car. I was driving a 76 uh, Monte Carlo, and we'd pile in there, and we'd be out in the crowd, and we'd be drinking that draft beer in those plastic cups, and, you know, with all the aforementioned smells in the, uh, in the uh, arena, in the atmosphere, and I'm telling you, man, uh, and about 87, 88, you know, that's when things were really started on the decline there. The, the, the glory years of world class championship wrestling were kind of in the early to mid eighties. And so it was a little bit on the decline, but it was still badass. And I remember going out there with my buddies and man, we would drink beer, we would get drunk and we would throw stuff at the wrestlers and the guys, the heels that had heat, we'd cheer for the baby faces and everybody everybody i don't give a damn if you was a guy or you was a girl you cheered for devon Ayers because devon Ayers were like rock stars back in the day and i can't overemphasize how over those guys were i cannot tell you how over the von Ayers were like nothing i'd ever seen before they were gods and so man you cheered for the von Ayers just because uh, it was a thing to do and, and you're like Later on in my years, you know, I, I would come to start cheering for the heels because I thought the heels were, were cool because of the, the tactics that they used. And I was just a total wrestling fan, hook, line, and sinker. And, of course, you know, I had my favorite baby faces as well, but I tended sometimes to favor the heels because of the cheating and the tactics, the trash talk. And, uh, you know, and this was back when, you know, wrestling wasn't really exposed uh, like it would come to be. And uh, it, the the principles are still basically the same today, but it's a, it's a much different business. Again, going back to the thick of things there, I remember one day, uh, one night rather, we were out there in the audience, and it was me and my buddy Rob, 
and Kerry Von Eric was out there wrestling somebody, and Kerry's always just had those great genetics, that good physique, that V frame, those jacks, and um, he was over like God. And man, my buddy Rob, he, el- he elbows me in the ribs, and he says, "Man, you're as big as that guy. You need to get in there and give us a try." Now, first of all, there's no way I was as big as Kerry Von Eric. That dude had next level genetics. Uh, but the, the the point I was trying to make was I was big enough at about 250, 255, and training like a bodybuilder slash powerlifter, just come off the North Texas State University weightlifting program, had long blonde hair, I looked the part, and was athletic enough. And I was like, you know, all through my junior high days, all through my high school days, I thought in the back of my mind, because I love the business so much, that that's what I wanted to do. And for you people that have listened to me talk before, you know, I always want to be a musician as well, but I couldn't sing or play an instrument. So, you know, all of a sudden, wrestling really becomes a reality for me. And so I'm thinking about it, and I'm working on the freight dock. I'm making 12 bucks an hour. Life is good. And I got a little, uh, I lived in Denton, Texas, right off an exit by the uh, Texaco station. And I can't remember the name of the street I lived on, but it was a little white house. And, uh, I had two window unit air conditions in it, and I had put foil all over the exterior of all the windows to keep the heat out because the house wasn't air conditioned very well. And I had a color TV, and I had a uh, brindle, I had a brindle pit bull named Abby uh, that I'd bought from my buddy in high school, and I'd had Abby since she was seven weeks old. And man, I tell you what, life was good, and life was simple. And like I said, pretty much all I had was a refrigerator. I can't even remember if microwaves existed back then. I had a color TV, uh, built a little console on the center block with some one by 12s and I had a remote control. And I think that's all you need in life. A couch, a bed, two air conditioner units, and a color TV. And I worked on the freight dock and I'm thinking, hey man, this is good. And I turn on TV one time And all of a sudden, there's a commercial, and it's on uh, World Class Championship Wrestling. And it's a guy known none other than Gentleman Chris Adams from Stratford-on-Avon, wherever it was from, England. And he was pumping up the fact that he was starting a wrestling school down at the Sportatorium. I watched that commercial, and for $45, you could go down there and listen to this guy put on a seminar for an hour, and he would tell you, what he was going to teach you, how he was going to teach it to you for 45 bucks. You go to the seminar and he would teach you and tell you about the wrestling school. And I was sitting there and that was revelation. I said, man, 45 bucks go down on a Saturday morning right after they do the television taping because they, they shoot the live show Friday night. That was a match. That, that was when all the big matches went on. And then Saturday morning at 10 a.m., they'd come back and do uh, television that went out live that night uh, for the next week. And so this uh, little seminar was going to be after that morning's television taping. And so I figured, you know what? This is something that I've got to be a part of. And so I figured, man, I better scrap together my best outfit. And here's what I wore. Back in the day, there used to be a company, they might still be around, called Gerbo. And they were kind of fancy uh, pants. And, you know, you just buttoned and zipped them up on your waistline, and then they had snaps you buttoned around your ankles. And you wore loafers with them. So I had a, I think it was a black pair of loafers, black jerbo jeans i had a purple izod shirt and i had long blonde hair and that was the best clothes that i owned and so i was going to roll up to the sportatorium in this outfit and and believe me man i'm a guy that doesn't like to get dressed up but this is about as dressed up as i could get and i think i look pretty damn presentable so i go up to the sportatorium i park my car and i didn't go to the matches i came after the matches And right when I get there, I can see a line forming uh, outside this single door. And these were all the people that were going to be going to Chris Adams Wrestling School Seminar. Didn't know if they was going to join up yet. It cost 45 bucks just to get in the seminar and to hear what the business was about in Chris's presentation. So I'll never forget, I'm standing in line. Long blonde hair, purple shirt, black pants, loafers. 
And as we're coming out, I can see the Samoan SWAT team come out. I can see Wild Bill Irwin come out. I can see various wrestlers coming out, man. They got towels around their necks. They're all hot, sweaty, just got out of the shower, just got finished working Saturday morning TV taping. They're trying to get to their cars. They got a show to work at night, so they got places to go. And I'm standing there in line, and people see me, and they start saying, Hey, man, can I get your autograph? And when someone asks you for your autograph and you're just standing in line and it never rustled for one single second inside a squared circle, it's kind of uh, embarrassing because, and, and this is what I would tell the people. I said, hey, man, I said, I, I'm not a wrestler yet. I said, I'm trying to be. I'm going to go to to the seminar, but I said, I don't wrestle. And uh, they, they said, oh, it doesn't matter. You're going to make it. Go ahead and sign, a, sign for us anyway. So, man, you talk about being put on the spot. You you never want to do that because you feel like a prick. The guys who are actually real wrestlers are coming out of the building, and I'm over signing autographs. At this point, I'm a wannabe. So, well, when they press you to sign your name, you just kind of sign your name. So with my sorry-ass handwriting, I just scribble out Steve Williams on their piece of paper, and they say, thanks. I said, well, you're welcome. I said, well, don't worry. You're going to make it. Well, anyway, uh the line uh, starts moving in. All the people start moving inside because all the people are exiting the sportatorium. It's time for the seminar. And it seems to me that there was about 35 or 40, no more than that, people that showed up at the seminar. And for the most part, everybody was kind of normal looking, you know, just regular everyday people. There wasn't anybody that was particularly jacked up or in the kind of shape that I was in. Again, I just got finished playing football and had been just crushing it in the gym every single day after working on the freight dock. So I was in real good shape and had that long blonde hair. And I didn't have a whole lot of hair, uh, but, you know, as you know now, I had to shave it all off because I had a receding hairline, but back then I didn't. And I had this neon bright white hair that you could not miss and I stood out in the crowd and I tell you what Chris Adams immediately took notice of me and uh I'll continue with the conversation after Chris spotted me in that car and I'm coming right back after this this is the Steve Austin show Geico asks how would you love a chance to save some money on insurance of course you would and when it comes to great rates on insurance, GEICO can help, like with insurance for your car, truck, motorcycle, boat, and RV. Even help with homeowners or renters' coverage. Plus, add an easy-to-use mobile app, available 24-hour roadside assistance, and more, and GEICO is an easy choice. Switch today and see all the ways you could save. It's simple. Go to GEICO.com or contact your local agent today. The Steve Austin Show. The Steve Austin Show. So anyway, there we were. We're at the seminar. And it cost me 45 bucks. And if, it, if I'm not mistaken, I believe Chris collected that money up front <laughs> because Chris was a smart guy. He was going to get his 45 bucks. you got to figure if you got uh, 45 bucks times about 30 or 40 people, eh, that's a pretty good little payday. So he starts talking about school and what he's going to teach and how he's going to teach it. And about three times he singles me out. He goes, he goes, you know what that, you know, Chris had that great uh, English accent that was easy to understand. It was easy on the ears and he was very charismatic individual and he could really turn it on. He could really sell you something. And, you know, he looked at me and he goes, you know, just because you were a football player, it doesn't mean that you're going to be able to do this kind of stuff. And he kind of jabbed me about three times about just because you used to be a football player doesn't mean you'll be able to do professional wrestling. And it kind of started getting on my nerves because I was a highly competitive person way back in the day. Still am. But it, it speaks to how competitive I am at back then. And so finally, the meeting wrapped up. And uh, on my way out, you know, Chris went out of his way to say, hey, Steve, uh, thanks for coming out. And I hope to see you again. And at that point, I took the time to tell him, I said, hey, dude, I said, you keep talking about, you know, if, if you're a football player, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be able to do this stuff. I said, hey, man, I play football. I said, if you show me how to do this, I said, I can do it. And he just kind of looks at me because I guess he never had anybody, you know, look at him and tell him, you know, like that. I'm from a rookie greenhorn, never been in a business standpoint. And he kind of just looks at me with this disbelief and just shakes his head. It almost blows me off. Okay, Steve, 
well, you know, I know he was hoping I'd show up, but hey, man, you know, I don't know how many people, you know, try to get into the business of pro wrestling end up falling on their face. So, you know, saying something is one thing, doing it is a whole other thing. But I was going to prove to this guy that I can learn how to uh, wrestle. So anyway, I can't remember how it comes about. Uh, end up getting his phone number. Uh, I was going to sign up for the class. I remember the class costed 1500 bucks. At the time, I did not have 1500 bucks, so I would just pay Chris as I went along. And Chris had a, a guy that was helping teach the class, and his name was Chico, a Spanish guy with a, a Lucha Libre background, but a big guy. He was about 6'1", 6'2", 230 pounds, very technical, very cool, been around the horn for a long time. Can't remember how many years he'd been working, worked a lot in the hood. Uh, but he was a guy who really kind of taught us the bumps, uh, rolling procedures. We did a lot of rolling drills. We learned the flat back bump, just standing there and falling down and slapping the mat. And it was like a, it was like a karate or a judo fall. Anytime you fall, you slap the mat to save yourself. By slapping that mat, you stop the impact and you attack the mat. And, uh, that would become the basis for, you know, learning how to take a bump that exists to this day. And then came the time where, you know, the guys would get on their hands and knees and then you would, you know, kind of do a catapult off their back as they were parallel to the ground and take a bigger bump. And things kind of proceeded, you know, at that rate. And there was a few people that, that stood out in the crowd. Uh, I think me from a look standpoint, but as we started to learn some of the wrestling holes and some of the maneuvers, I was very, very green of course, because I'd never done it and was not a fast learner. This was not easy for me to pick up. I had an aggressive competitive nature, but when you're aggressive and trying to compete at something you don't know what to do, it's a whole different ball game. because here's the thing. I'm trying to learn how to wrestle, had never wrestled before, and at no point in time has Chris told any of us that this was a work, how that it worked. Uh, how you call a high spot we weren't there yet uh, we never called a high spot in that class uh, but there were a couple of people that stand out and there was one guy named todd if his name wasn't todd martin i believe that's what it was but todd's problem was he was about a buck 80 if that maybe five ten. but he was good he was a wrestling fan from uh, way back when he was a kid and he was kind of like the standout person of the class then there was another guy named Dwayne, and Dwayne was about 400, 450, and, you know, he was just that big grizzly bear kind of look. So you figure, you know, maybe he had a chance, outside chance, of making it as a big man, but he didn't really have the athletic ability. He just had that size. And, and there was a very uh, cute girl named Denise. I think she had a couple of matches as Dazzling Denise, and she was a standout as far as the females. And I think there might have been only one, two, or three females in the class to begin with, if that. But I remember Denise standing out. She was very good. She caught on very fast. And so and then we started uh, working out, and uh, time progresses. And this is how it works. Uh, or this is how it worked for me at Chris Adams School. We would train once a week on Saturday mornings after the uh, television taping, and then Chris would have to go on and do a job at night and work somewhere. And I can't remember. I think the class lasted about two hours. And so when you only have one ring, your time is about two hours, and you're in there with about 30 cats. Uh, not everybody signed up, so I think we started off with 25 to 30 cats. you got one ring. you got to start off with your warm-up session, and then you're trying to teach each one of these individuals. All these drills are just the basics from uh, Jump Street. I mean, you're, you're training people that are basically kindergarten with respect to wrestling, and you, your ring time, I mean, that class might have lasted two hours, my whole time in the ring might have been 15 minutes because you had to wait your turn for someone else to go, especially when it came down to uh, learning how to run the ropes. And uh, I'll never forget, Mick Foley tells this story all the time. For some reason, you know, well, not for some reason, he was working the sportatorium that night uh, or, or had already worked and was just hanging around. And he was up in a, a place we called the Crow's Nest. And this was kind of like a kayfabe area up at the top of the sportatorium, which was fenced in, jail style. And a lot of the boys would go back there. It was real dark back there. And would watch some of the matches uh, from this area of, of vantage point with their girlfriends or wives or whatever. And Mick Foley saw me running the ropes that day. And uh, he's gone on to tell the story that of all the people who were there, uh, nobody really stood out, but I did, just because of the way I was attacking and running the ropes. 
And so, but the wrestling part of it was not so easy for me. And we did this for about five months. And all of a sudden, you know, Chris says to me, all right, Steve, I think you're ready for your first match. And I'm thinking, all right, I'm ready for my first match. What are we going to do? And uh, where is it going to be? He goes, it's going to be uh, on Saturday morning, uh, next Saturday. And uh, man, I had to come up with an opponent for me. It turns out the opponent that I wrestled was a guy from, uh, I think, cut off Louisiana. And he wrestled under the name of Frogman LeBlanc. Now, Frogman LeBlanc, I don't know too much about him, but he always wore kind of green, t- green tights. He had frazzled blonde hair. He was Cajun to the bone, and hence the name Frogman. And he was kind of like a journeyman, kind of like a, kind of like a, he was a journeyman. I don't want to say jobber, but I mean, that, that, that he did a lot of, he did a lot of jobs. And he wasn't the most coordinated person in the world, but, you know, he was in the business of pro wrestling to try to make it just like everybody else was. He just didn't make it real far. And so Chris figured that Frogman would have the ability to help lead me through a match due to the fact that he had some years of experience with him. Uh, so anyway, I'll never forget, Saturday morning, we go into Chris's office at the top of the sportatorium, and I guess it was Fritz's old office at the time. Uh, I don't know if Chris Adams had a hand in booking, but, you know, up to this point, Chris had never talked to us about calling a high spot, never talked to us about the business being a work, never told us how a win or loss was gained. Uh, we never learned about chair shots. We never learned about blade jobs. We learned how to take a bump, a uh, modicum of chain wrestling, and how to run the ropes. And then from then on, as almost anything is in life, it's called on-the-job training. Well, we kind of went over the basics of a match, which, you know, is kind of like today's system where, you know, everything's kind of predetermined. You know what you're going to do. So I kind of knew what I was going to do out there with Frogman, kind of A to Z, except we really only got to about A to M. And I just remember in the match, and you could probably find this match on YouTube, although I would recommend that you do not because it's so rotten. You can see from my first lockup with Frogman how green I am, how, uh, you know, the, the lockups, the posture, uh, the body language moving around the ring, no confidence, no knowledge, uh, didn't know whether to crap or wind my watch. But nonetheless, all of a sudden, on my first match in the history of my career, it's a televised match with a journeyman wrestler who's, you know, okay. He's not a great worker by any stretch. The referee in that match was a guy named Tony Falk, cowboy Tony Falk, when he wrestled. Tony Falk was a damn good hand in the ring. He's a journeyman guy, but Tony Falk could, could work, and he's a really, really good referee as well. And he was a good dude, and he always tried to help me. I got nothing but respect for Tony. There's a couple times out there in that match. Boy, I tell you what, when those cameras are rolling, you got a crowd out there. And I think I wrestled that first match. I had some black and blue striped uh, long tights on. And I was stinking out the joint. Had a bunch of arm bars on Frogman. I probably clotheslined him about four, five, six times in a space of about eight minutes. And I remember we were up there in the finish room, and Chris says, you know, Steve, I want you to finish with kind of like a running clothesline. But when I gave the clothesline, he wanted me to uh, go down on the back, uh, you know, and take a bump as I gave that clothesline. And I said, okay, cool. And so that was my finished move on Frogman Blank was the kind of running clothesline where I would take a bump as well. And so that's what I used as my finish. We go out there and we stunk the joint out. Cowboy Tony Falk tried to call a couple of high spots for us. And uh, because I was in a jam, and then, you know, I don't hear very well as uh, on top of that, and you got cameras rolling, it was an absolute abortion. And I figured, okay, you know, finally the match was over. I got my win. I remember getting right out of the ring. I barely remember uh, going to the back and uh, taking a shower and getting out of there uh, because it was funny. Prior to my first match, I had done a few promos with Chris Adams out in the ring talking about, hey, I was his new student, and I was going to be making my debut soon. And when I came in, because the business was so kayfabe back in, you guys had been to the Sportatorium before, uh, kind of know what I'm talking about. But if you'd never been to the Sportatorium, you come in this door, and then the dress room's to the left, where it's heels and babies back there. So Chris wasn't going to let me back there because, 
you know, I was just a new guy in the school. The business is still protected. So when you come in the door to the sportatorium, if you hang a quick right, that's the janitor's room. And it's a room about as big as a closet. And I mean a small closet. And that's where I had to dress because they wouldn't let the new guy go back there with all the heels of babies because, you know, they hadn't smartened me up yet. So that was kind of weird. And I'll never forget the first night that I got a chance to actually go into the locker room because now I was on the inside, so to speak. Nobody knew me. Nobody knew who I was. They had seen my rotten match. But, you know, inevitably, new guys get in the business. I was that guy. So I walked around, and, you know, uh, I was a pretty shy kid growing up. Now, athletically, you know, I was uh, uh, always ready to prove myself in any athletic endeavor. And so being humbled by all these badass veterans, you know, kind of sheepishly made my round uh, and introduced myself to everybody. And I'll never forget, I didn't know if it was a rib or if he was out there on Planet Nine or something, something like that. But Kevin Von Erich, I remember him coming up there and shaking my hand three times. He goes, hey, brother, it's nice to see you again. And uh, I said, hey, we used to have some good matches back in the day. And I told him, I said, Kevin, I said, this is my first day. I said, I'm just starting out. <laughs> so, again, I don't know if he's ribbing or what, because uh, it was kind of a party standard back in. But uh, anyway, I would come to uh, wrestle Kevin Von Erich on a, a few occasions, and it seems like every time I wrestle Kevin Von Erich, of course, me being a greenhorn, I come out on the losing end of the stick. I think I lost uh, every single match I wrestled with Kevin Von Erich with uh, the Iron Claw, and then on a couple times, I remember uh, making some of the local shots. We were working shots like Cleburne, Terrell, uh, Jacksboro, National Guard, uh, just just local towns like that. I can't remember all of them. Those would be our little spot shows that we were running. And, and so I remember sometimes uh, Ke- Kerry Von Erich's opponent wouldn't show up, and I'd have to wrestle Kerry. Well, when I say have to, to wrestle Kerry, it was an honor to wrestle Kerry, but Hell, by that time, Kerry had already been in the business, you know, 10 years. He was he was like a superstar. So to wrestle some Jay Brown like me, you know, I didn't get any heat on him. We wrestled for about four minutes, or I shined him up for four minutes. All of a sudden, Iron Claw City, I'm on my back doing the J-O-B, which was, hey, man, I didn't have any problem with losing. It was just badass to be in the ring with, one, Kevin Von Erich, two, Kerry Von Erich. And then, you know, as the as time would go on, and uh, I would ask uh, Jerry Jarrett, and Jerry Jarrett had just bought the, the promotion from Fritz Von Erich way back in the day at about 89, 90. And I told Jarrett, I said, uh, hey, man, when do you think I can start working full time? And, uh, you know, this is while I was doing those road shows. And I was still working at Watkins Motor Lines, working my 40-hour weeks. And then on uh, a lot of the Friday and Saturday shows, you know, some of the heels would come in and just literally beat the trash out of me. You know, to, uh, P.Y., Chew High, uh, whoever it was, beat the hell out of me with kendo sticks and weightlifting belts. And these guys were laying their stuff in because this was a chance for them to get heat on a local, you know, white meat baby face that, you know, wasn't going to do any damage to because, you know, I was just a body out there, but I was a good-looking kid, and they can get some heat on me and further their cause and let me pay my dues. And so while they was beating the trash out of me, you know, I was just doing my thing, paying my dues, and uh, that's when Jeff Jarrett said, hey, man, I think you're ready now. Steve, we'll send you down there uh, to Tennessee in two weeks because basically the business back in uh, was based more out of Tennessee, and uh, Dallas was on Friday evenings and Saturday mornings. For a while, that was all going to change because when Jarrett bought it out, and I remember driving to uh, Memphis, Tennessee, Mid-South Coliseum, and that's where Dutch Mantel gave me the Steve Austin name. But that was a weekly territory, and Monday was Memphis, uh, Mid-South Coliseum. Tuesday was Louisville at the Louisville Gardens. Wednesday was Evansville at the Evansville, uh, whatever that was called, and that's where we got paid. Thursday was a spot show. Friday, you got on a bus and drove all day long to get to, uh, all night long to get to Dallas, Texas to work the sportatorium at night. Then after the sportatorium on Friday, you know, if you was uh, around the Dallas area at Industrial and Cadiz, around the sportatorium was about three or four liquor stores. It wasn't the greatest section of town. So all you had to do was walk across the street to get you a 12 pack of beer, whiskey, whatever your flavor was. That's what you was going to be drinking 
because we was going to drive all night long from Friday till Saturday morning. We rolled up at Memphis there at the TV studio, and we did morning television, live TV. And then after live TV, you know, take a shower, get back on a the bus. They drop you off at your cars that you left them on Thursday at the spot show. You drive back to your hotel. Uh, and I was living at the Congress Inn at that time. Tom Pritchard was living in the same hotel about five rooms down from me. And you'd go down to your hotel, chill out for a couple hours, and then head to the fairgrounds on Saturday night. And you'd work uh, Nashville, Tennessee. And the best thing about working uh, that territory was you were working the same damn buildings, same damn towns, a lot of times the same damn guy every single night because that's the way it was working. If you're working a program with someone, you're working them around the horn and you're coming back around. So you got to change stuff up every single time. Uh, you know, you go to, you know, the, the building wrestle. And then a lot of times, I man, half the people were, were following, you know, the wrestling matches from town to town. And a lot of these were females, of course, but you had to change your matches because you couldn't just do the same thing over and over again. Like you get on a program a lot of times in, in WWE, you know, if we was working, man, another guy or working on a loop, we might have the same damn match for, you know, two months at a time because you can. And But back then, you couldn't get away with that, and it forced you to be really sharp, really fast. And any time you do something with that on-the-job training, with that repetition, that's where you get that experience from. And I was working with so many guys. You know, I was traveling up and down the road with uh, gorgeous Gary Young, who was a badass veteran worker, never got a big break. But that's a guy that I got half my psychology from. And, you know, working with uh, uh, Chris Adams, you know, I mean, he was teaching me everything. And he was very, very patient with a very, very green, aggressive guy. And, of course, on some of those inaugural trips coming out of the Dallas-Fort Worth area before I went to Tennessee, you know, I was riding the back of a Delta 88 with Bronco Lubitsch, who was a former tag team wrestler turned referee and one and only Skandar Akbar, who was a head of Devastation Incorporated, a manager who had also wrestled back in the day, and he was the evil villain. And, man, when you're riding down the road asking those guys questions and they're willingly dropping knowledge on you, it was one of the funnest times of my life. And so uh, I just remember, you know, uh, going back to when I was still at North Texas State, and some of the most vivid memories I have of Dallas, just because I want to bring this home to, to bring it about Dallas, was how hot the uh, was how hot the Von Erichs were and rock star status, and you can only I can only tell you about it if you go back and watch some stuff on YouTube. I think you can uh, you can uh, understand and 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 feel how over those guys were. Those people loved Devon Ayers. And, of course, the guys did first and foremost as well. But, I mean, the chicks were crazy about Devon Ayers. And, man, when they came out, whether it was Stranglehold, Kevin Von Ayers' music, or if it was Modern Day Warrior Carries music, or, you know, when David was still around, I mean, the roof blew off that place. And it was funny because they only had these little bitty uh, one-strand security ropes up. And when those Von Erics would come down those, those steps to enter the ring, they would basically be getting mugged. That Girls are grabbing their hands, uh, placing phone numbers written on paper, kissing them, mugging them, groping them. I mean, that it, it was a shoot. I mean, that's just the way it is. The Von Erics were like rock stars. Well, then, on the other side of that came those damn fabulous free birds. Michael Hayes, Terry Bam Bam Gordy, Buddy Jack Roberts. And, mister, let me tell you something. They'd already been coming through there a couple times prior to me coming out there, driving my 76 Monte Carlo to see them guys. But all of a sudden, here comes Michael Hayes. And, man, he changed my whole perception or whole perspective of the business, man. That dude came down there in that sequin red robe, whether it's one of the rebel flag, whatever. I don't want to make a rat's ass about that, but you talk about – you talk about a showman. Michael Hayes was a heat-seeking missile. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. When they was baby faces, I mean, he was over as hell. Those people loved Michael Hayes, Gordy, and Buddy Jack Roberts because they was on the good side. But I tell you what, when they flipped hill, they had a monstrous amount of shoot heat. And, man, that damn Michael Hayes would come out there just a pure showman. He'd get on that second turnbuckle. He'd start gyrating his hips. 
and uh, flicking his hair back and doing that strut that he had. And I tell you what, man, Michael wasn't trying to be a character. Michael was that guy. He was just, he was being him, but turned up to 10 in front of about 5,000 people. And I always tell people, Michael Hayes, if, you ain't, if you're a fan of pro wrestling, watch some of the work that the Freebirds were doing. Watch some of that stuff they did back there when they were selling out Texas Stadium. Watch that stuff when they was uh, doing those matches in the Sportatorium, whether they babyfaces baby faces, how over they were, and, and the fire that Michael had and all those guys had, or when they were heats, that despicable nature that they had about them when it came time to get heat, how nasty they would get. Watch those facial expressions of Michael Hayes. Watch him grab a microphone and start ripping off a bunch of trash, talking promos and saying what they were going to do or make an excuse of why they lost. Uh, those are what I remember about Dallas, Texas. I remember my beginning, but it was kind of like, you know, growing up, and sitting there in Edna, Texas, and watching that guy have that iron claw on Dusty Rhodes and Dusty Rhodes bleeding like a stuck pig, and I wanted that security guard to help him. Uh, uh, that's what captured me at seven or eight, and then all these years later to be there right there. It was almost past the peak. Uh, it was past the peak of world-class championship wrestling, but I was there to see some uh, incredible, badass, sold-out uh, houses with action-packed stuff. And I remember the stuff leading up to that, you know, the Texas Stadium stuff, and, uh, you know, after David had died, un unfortunately. But, man, when I rolled back into Dallas, Texas uh, last night on that airplane, and I was just sitting there thinking about the podcast, but as soon as I came into this room and I saw that airport, and then someone sent me a picture on Twitter, you know, they told, you know, they, uh, they tore the sportatorium down many years ago now. And to this day, it doesn't look, according to the picture on Twitter, that someone sent me, they have not built a building there since. It's just a, a corner lot. And I guess the liquor stores are all still in business. I guess it's still not the greatest part of town. But I never knew why they tore that building down and didn't make it, uh, you know, like uh, not a national but a state landmark or something because of all the famous people there, of what it meant to the business of pro wrestling and maybe to make a museum out of it and maybe economically or it just wouldn't have panned out or uh, from a standpoint of how what state the, the business, the, the building was in. You know, that it needed to be tore down. Maybe it was an eyesore. It'd, it'd kind of fall off in a couple of years because of the neglect. But so many memories uh, of, of there. And I remember when you walked into that place and you went into, uh, I think, guess at the time it was Percy Pringle's office. And they had that just kind of, like, you know, that, uh, that damn old plywood kind of uh, stuff that they stuck on the walls, little grooves in it. And there was eight by ten pictures of everybody that had come through world class championship wrestling, and you see those pictures on the wall. And I always remember seeing Rick Rude's picture there, Ultimate Warrior's picture was there, all of Von Erichs were on there, Matt Bourne's face was on there, uh, all the guys. He's and the stars of the stars. Anybody came through there had those pictures on that wall. And it was just an old ramshackle, rough house building. But when you saw the list of those, the talent that had come through there, man, you knew that, you know, God dang, there had been some badass talent here drawing some serious money and uh, people, the, the atmosphere being so crazy. And I always tell people these days, I don't miss the business anymore, but I have a lot of fond memories. And when I got out of the business due to my neck issues, it took me three years to come to grips with that. And I dealt with it in the ways that I did, and then finally came out to uh, L.A. and started uh, working in the uh, reality television business, doing some low-budget movies. took me a long time to get over the, the fact that I was not in the business of pro wrestling anymore. But it all starts and stops with uh, first memories of Houston wrestling, Paul Box Promotions, Sam Houston Coliseum, Dusty Rhodes, and then my college days, my formative years at North Texas State University on an athletic scholarship, being exposed to the Dallas product. Had I went to University of New Mexico, had I decided to venture out of state, there's not a professional wrestling scene in Albuquerque, New Mexico. My destination was always to be a pro wrestler. And I think in the back of my mind, that's what I wanted to do. But I think it was a higher level plan for me to do. It was almost predestiny 
to a degree, and I really believe that because I didn't want to leave the state of Texas. The only school, I wanted to go to Southwest Texas State. I wanted to go to Sam Houston State. I wanted to go down to Texas A&I in Kingsville. I wanted to go anywhere but North Texas State. North Texas State wasn't even on my radar, but they were the only uh, other major college to offer me a scholarship after I got out of Wharton County Junior College, and it put me right in, 30 miles away from Dallas, Texas, the Sportatorium. And I saw that commercial, and I knew uh, the freight company was grooming me for a job to go inside and do management and, and, and manage a terminal because I was a smart cat, I caught, caught on to everything uh, outside. I worked my way up to top pay. And what you do with a guy like that, you move him up in the system. And right when they were going to give me that promotion, I said, nope, I'm going to go to professional wrestling, and I'm going to try uh, this out first. And they said, okay, Steve. And finally, you know, when I hauled ass, went down to Mid-South, you know, that's when I gave them my two-week notice. I quit the business uh, of moving freight and driving a forklift and got into the business of professional wrestling in the back end of 1989 and through a high-profile angle with gentleman Chris Adams in 1990, won Pro Wrestling Illustrated Rookie of the Year. And the rest, as they say, is history. I'm here in Dallas, Texas. I'm watching the planes take off at DFW Airport. I'm fixing to head over to American Airlines Arena. And I'll leave, I'll leave you with one little quick story about American Airlines Arena. Because I was there at the first wrestling match they had at this arena. They built this thing up, and they wanted a badass main event at that show. And uh, WWE was scheduled to go in. So I get a call from, I think it was Jim Ross. And his hey, man, to open up a new uh, arena in Dallas, Texas. It's American Airlines Arena. They want you in rock uh, to, to, to break that building in. And I said, all right, man, that's cool. And so, <laughs> of course, I always love working with The Rock, one of my favorite opponents of all time. So, anyway, we go out there. And I just said, hey, man, we we'll figure we'd jumpstart this thing. And me and Rock always called everything in the ring. We worked together. I don't know how many times he could read my mind and so I could read his. And I remember, you know, I jumped his ass and had him in a turnbuckle. And uh, I was really taking care of him that night. And I was swinging for the fence. He was rocking his head back and forth by five, six punches. I said, spin me around. He spun me around and started throwing punches at me. Every one of them missing by about six inches. <laughs> Finally, the crowd's going absolutely crazy because we're swinging so fast and we're selling so much, it doesn't look like we're not connecting. And finally, I looked at Rock and I said, God dang, I said, one of us going to have to hit each other sooner or later. <laughs> and Rock started laughing his ass off and we busted off in our first high spot. And the rest of it was uh, uh, goes into history books as one badass match. Anyway, I'm going to bring this thing back. I'm going to uh, bring you guys my match of the week, and it's going to be a barn burner, as you will see. Uh, I just got finished talking to Brock Lesnar on the WWE Network. He's going to be in my match of the week. Stay right here. Come right back after a message from the uh, sponsors who keep the show on the air for free. I'm taking you down memory lane, my memories of Dallas, Texas, and I'm coming in to wrap this thing up because they are giving me to go home to you. Okay, exactly who do Sean and Larry King talk to on their podcast? I spoke to Donald Trump today. You heard of him? Yeah, the Donald. Okay. The Donald. <laughs> he, he called and um, we invited him on our podcast, and he said, well, he will come on within the next month. And that later this month happens Friday, October 23rd. That means Trump joins an already impressive celeb list, including comic legends Martin Short and Carl Reiner, mom and masters of sex star Allison Janney, Dr. Drew Pinsky, Empire's Tasha Smith, botch star Dr. Paul Massett, The Blacklist, Megan Boone, Craig Ferguson, Jeff Ross, and so many more. It's good to be the king. Download your favorite episode of Back and Forth with Sean and Larry King today at podcastone.com. That's podcastone.com. All right, everybody, give me the go-home cue. It's time to wrap up this podcast and ride off into the sunset. And that actually means riding over to American Airlines Arena and seeing what they got in store for me. As you listen to this, it already happened, so I don't know what I'm getting myself into. That being said, it's going to take me right to my match of the week. And I tell you what, I've been watching a lot of Brock Lesnar matches lately. And I tell you what, you talk about a bust-ass, badass match, and you go all the way. Back to September 18, 2003, Brock Lesnar versus Kurt Angle in a 60-minute Ironman match, and a match that uh, Brock Lesnar goes over on. And I, I'm telling you what, man, you talk about uh, this is a match that anybody would be proud to be in. It just goes to show. I mean, I always say Kurt Angle is one of the fastest guys I've ever seen pick up the business of pro wrestling. I would put Brock Lesnar right behind him, but also, I mean, just a phenomenal talent. And of course, I knew Brock Lesnar was going to be money as soon as he walked in the doors of WWF. 
And, and of course, the same thing about Kurt Angle. But nonetheless, man, these two guys put on a clinic of a match. And you got to realize, you know, in 2003, I guess Brock Lesnar got called up to the main roster in 2002, was down in OVW for a little bit. But, I mean, and three years in the business or a little bit less than three years in the business puts on a showcase like this. It's a hell of a match. It's a match you can watch and learn something from. And you can also watch uh, the evolution of uh, Brock's uh, style. You know, he comes from a wrestling background. Obviously, he's in here with a, a guy with a gold medal in the Olympics of wrestling. So this wrestling is par excellence as far as that goes when they do that. But also just how, uh, you know, Brock, because of his size, also has always been somewhat of a brawler because he doesn't need to use all that wrestling background when he can physically hammer people. And he's developed that into the style that he possesses today, which is the main event style that predatory style where he just hits suplex city and he's created a very unique uh brawling style he can wrestle when he wants to he can do anything he wants to and you know i i think wrestling the style that he is really protects himself and his body and well sometimes his opponent's going to suffer from that but you're going to take bumps anyway but i think he's really created an interesting style specific to who and what brock lesnar is the biggest guy the biggest baddest guy out there right now in a 20 by 20 squared circle i mean you can say the big show's bigger but with respect to athleticism and explosive power with what brock possesses and then the combination of what Kurt's doing here uh, in this match, going back to the match, that's my match of the week. Brock Lesnar versus Kurt Angle from SmackDown on September 18, 2003, episode 213. You can find it on the WWE Network. But interesting to see uh, how Brock has parlayed you know, this performance into the style that he now possesses, which is that of a great white shark. Just attack Suplex City. Anyway, it's time for me to wrap this thing up. I'm looking forward to talking to Brock. Man, I didn't have a guest this week, but I basically laid down my beginnings into the business of pro wrestling, what Dallas, Texas means to me. And it's uh, kind of like a, a little bit of a hometown for me in so many respects. And it's great to be back in the great state of Texas, coming out of Los Angeles. Hey, I want to thank the guys over at Pro Wrestling Tees once again. Ryan and the guys have been cranking out some great designs for me. And we got a lot of new shirts coming up. And I know Christmas is coming up right around the corner. So we're going to start releasing a couple of these T-shirts so you guys can do some uh, Christmas shopping here in the next few weeks. And we'll be releasing a couple of shirts, not just one. But I appreciate all the word of mouth advertising you guys have been doing on behalf of this podcast. I appreciate y'all supporting the sponsors of the Steve Austin Podcast because they're the ones who let me do this for you for free twice a week. So I want to give a big thanks to dollarshaveclub.com. Use my promo code Steve to get great quality razors delivered right to your front door. Check us out. Burger King. Get the new extra long jalapeno cheeseburger. Fill the flame with two all beef patties stacked with spicy jalapeno peppers. Now part of the two for five dollar deal. Only at Burger King. Limited time only. Restrictions apply. And thanks to Amazon. I've been supporting the podcast since day one. Just use my Amazon links whenever you're doing any online shopping, and Amazon will kick back a few bucks to the podcast. It will not cost you nothing extra. There ain't no hidden fees or charges. You can buy whatever you was planning on buying and help out the podcast in the process. You can find my Amazon links by going to podcastone.com. Click on the Support Our Show Sponsors banner at the top of the page and then hitting the Steve Austin Show button. I got Amazon links for Amazon USA, Amazon UK, and Amazon Canada. So again, just go to podcastone.com, click the Support Our Show Sponsors banner, and then click on the Steve Austin Show. All my great sponsors are there. All my Amazon links are there, too, and Amazon will kick back a few bucks to the show every time you use one of those links. It helps us pay our production fees. You don't get charged anything extra. But... That's the best way that you can support the show. I open, I deliver two cans of audio will pass for you for free twice a week. I appreciate your help in supporting the podcast. Hey, bookmark that gimmick so you can find it easier in one stroke. Until the next time, folks, my name is Steve Austin. and I am coming to you from Dallas, Texas, and I will catch you rest down the road. This has been a Podcast One production. Download new episodes of The Steve Austin Show every Tuesday at PodcastOne.com. That's PodcastONE.com. All this month, stream the funniest films for free on Pluto TV. Watch comedy classics like Anchorman, The Legend of Ron Burgundy, and Mean Girls. Or drop in for a Tyler Perry marathon with a Medea family funeral and Medea's witness protection. 
Pluto TV also has hundreds of channels and thousands of movies and TV shows like Get Shorty, Be Cool, Key and Peel, Comedy and Color, and more. And no contracts, no subscriptions, no fees, no joke. So download the Pluto TV app on your favorite streaming device and start laughing today. Pluto TV, drop in, watch free. Hey, sports fans, it's Chris Howard, former Jacksonville Jaguar running back and 1997 National Championship running back from the University of Michigan. Get plugged in with me every week as I'll be breaking down the biggest topics in the world of sports and entertainment. Join 